Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good, having a good morning. I'm so impressed. Um, we see a lot of conferences uh, at the museum. Uh, our, our fiscal year will end June 30th, and we'll have done 368 events in our fiscal 12 months. So we've really become a hub for Silicon Valley and conferences like this. And I have to say, you're among the most well-behaved people I have ever <laughs> seen. <laughs> Maybe I'm catching you on a good day. I wasn't here for the party last night, so I, so I don't know. But you know, I came in about 10 minutes before the keynote starts. Everybody's in their seats. Everybody's got their laptops open. You guys are all doing work. I'm so impressed. It's just fantastic. Uh, let me say, first of all, how glad we are to have you here. It's just incredible that you not only achieve the point where you can have your conference at the museum, but, but that you chose the museum to, to, to be your location, to be your venue. Uh, you know, I say all the time that when Silicon Graphics hit the rocks financially in 2000 and moved out of this beautiful building, they left a great museum behind. They just didn't know it at the time. Uh, so this building, which was built in 1994 by Jim Clark, uh, as the founder and chairman of Silicon Graphics, was uh, won every design award there was in Northern California when it was built. Jim told the architects in San Francisco, I'm tired of driving up and down 101 and seeing glass boxes with corporate names on them. I want a different kind of building. So when this building was built in 1994, it was called Shoreline Gateway. It won, as I said, all these big design awards. It's very distinctive. If you can imagine this building being built in 1994, it's got rooms like this, it's very angular, it's curved. If you look at it from the top, it looks like a sailboat. That's because Jim Clark was a world-class sailor. And when the architects were interviewing Jim about the favorite thing that he liked to do in the whole world, he said, I really like to sail. And they said, all right, Jim, we'll build, us, we'll build you a sailboat. So this building actually has a big curved hull that runs along the front of the street out there, and it's got a, it's got a mast, it's a spine that runs completely the length of the building. When you move from room to room over here, you'll be able to see it. It's got a glass skylight. And, and it's got all these little cabins and cubbies where people could break out and meet. This little area out here where uh, this just outside Han Auditorium was an espresso bar. That's very common today in Silicon Valley, but in 1994 for Silicon Graphics, that was one of the first espresso bars in, in the whole valley. So it was a very, very creative building. And um, less than 10 years later, SGI was near bankruptcy and everybody had moved out. So I really think from a standpoint of computer history, when we talk about high impact and people who are changing the world, there's a real savage reality about what happens in Silicon Valley, and it happens again and again, and now it's happening all over the world. You can be riding high one day, along comes an inflection point, and boom. That's it. That's what happened to Silicon Graphics. There was a young engineer working for Silicon Graphics who tried to sort of sound that alarm. You know, he was saying, computers are getting faster and better and cheaper. We should be going that route. Silicon Graphics looked the other way. They bought Cray. They decided to go high-end, super high-end, go from workstations to supercomputers. So that young engineer got frustrated, and he left, and he raised a little venture capital, and he built a chip, and he built a company, and his name is Jensen Wong. And his company is NVIDIA. And it's now the leading maker of GPUs in the world. So Jensen went his way, and Silicon Graphics went that way. That's what an inflection point will do for you. I'm going to talk a little bit about that this morning, because I think it's really relevant to all of us living in the world that we live in. So we see these inflection points all the time. In fact, history shows that they're a lot more common than they are uncommon. And it often happens that somebody comes along and looks at a whole array of technical innovations, moments of progress, uh, things that are happening around the world or within the industry in a disconnected way. And they have that kind of special ability to connect all those dots. And then the thing that's been happening for a while that looks evolutionary suddenly becomes boom revolutionary. It becomes a step change in the way that we compute, in the way that we network, in the way that we use apps, in the way that we're mobile, in the way that we're doing things in the world, living in the world today. And I want to talk a little bit about 
why that happens. So my title is how these geniuses and renegades are changing the world. Um, we're, we're all these folks. You're here in the room. Um, as I said at the opening, you're really probably the prime audience and prime people who could appreciate what happens here at the Computer History Museum. And I thought you might like having some of these beach geniuses and renegades highlighted for you. First of all, let me ask you, if you're going to look back across time, and it doesn't have to be that far, although it could be very far, and you were going to think about the, the geekiest, geniuses, renegadiest people you could think of in the history of computing, or person you could think of. And I'll give you a hint, it's not Gerald. It could be Gerald, but it's not Gerald. I'm not talking about him this morning. Who would you say they are, or, or it is, or he is, or she is? Just shout it out. Alan Turing. Sorry, Alan Turing? Okay, that's good. Tesla? Yarni Struskrip. We just inaugurated Yarni as a fellow of the museum in April. Pretty, pretty genius, renegade guy. Who else? Sorry? Max Maxwell. Somebody else? All right, so I'm going to talk about these guys. You know who they are? Fairchild. Founders of Fairchild Semiconductor. Happened about eight miles away from where you're sitting right now. Uh, they worked for a guy who was probably one of the most brilliant technical scientists of the 20th century. Uh, and he also happened to be a uh, terrible manager, Bill Shockley. So Shockley was the co-inventor of the transistor at Bell Labs at the end of the 1940s. He ended up winning the Nobel Prize with his, uh, with his, his uh, colleagues, John Bardeen and William Bratton. He had a very keen eye for talent. Shockley assembled an amazing array of engineers when he moved west to California to start a semiconductor company in the mid-1950s. Now, here's an accidental fact of computer history. There is no reason that Silicon Valley should be here if you date the start of Silicon Valley from Bill Shockley's move from Bell Labs in New Jersey to California. Because all the action in California in the mid-1950s was in L.A. That's where planes were being built. That's where the defense industry had grown up to fight the war in the Pacific. That's where all the technology that was being developed on the West Coast, mostly advanced applied high industry technology was being, that was all being built in LA, or in the Los Angeles area. Why did Bill Shockley move to Mountain View, California? Sorry? Stanford would be a good guess. His mother lives here. <laughs> and he wanted to be close to his mom. So he moved to Mountain View, California, and he bought a little office space over on San Antonio Road, and he started Shockley Semiconductor. Now, the thing about Bill Shockley, brilliant, driven, great judge of talent, great scientist, completely inflexible. Shockley believed that this proper substrate to build a semiconductor was not silicon, and he was not using silicon in order to try to isolate transistors on a piece of substrate. These guys, mostly, were convinced that Shockley was wrong. And they wanted to do things their way. They wanted to kind of open a shop like you see in Silicon Valley these days. Shockley was completely against it. So these were the eight brightest young scientists working for Shockley at the time, and he was very close to a breakthrough for the integrated circuit. But he just didn't get it to work because he was using the wrong materials. So these guys all got together one afternoon in a secret meeting off campus. And they said, you know what, we think we're gonna we're gonna do our own thing. We're gonna form our own company. We're, we're secure enough in our knowledge and our, tech, our our technical prowess and our approach to this. We're just gonna walk away and start something on our own. Now they ended up picking the most unusual guy to lead the breakaway and to break the news to Bill Shockley. The guy who would have thought would have told Shockley, we're leaving, we're gonna start our own company is the guy who's front and center. That's Bob Noyce. Smart, dynamic, enormous personality. 
Everybody followed Bob Noyce everywhere he went. He was the natural leader of the group. The thing about Bob Noyce was he hated conflict. And that was true of Noyce's entire career. Ask anybody who worked for Bob Noyce later. He didn't like confrontation. He would do almost anything to avoid it. The quietest guy, the most thoughtful guy, the guy who was least likely to tell Bill Shockley that they were taking a walk was the guy on the far left, the scientist, the chemist. He was the one chemist in the group. He was the guy who really understood the chemistry of trying to put a substrate together to build the materials that would allow you to put multiple transistors on a chip. His name was Gordon Moore. So Gordon decided that he would go see Shockley at the appointed time, on the appointed day. So he went to go see Shockley. Shockley, of course, was incensed. And he said to Gordon, do all these guys feel this way? And Gordon said, yes, they all feel this way. And he said, what about noise? He said, noise feels that way. He said, what about Jay Last, the quiet little guy on the other end? He said, yeah, Jay Last feels the same way. And Gordon finally said, look, Bill, you can ask them all. We all feel the same way. We're walking out. So in his lab notebook on that day, Bill Shockley made a single entry. Group leaves. They all walked out together. And they all decided to form Fairchild Semiconductor. They happen to know a bright young investment banker named Arthur Rock. Anyone ever heard of Arthur Rock? Arthur Rock basically is the inventor of venture capital. He was an investment banker in New York. He'd come west because he thought this was where all the innovation was happening. Thought she could make money on the ideas that were starting to pop up in Northern California around technology. And he decided to back these guys. He made a list on a yellow piece of legal notebook paper of all the people he was going to ask to invest in this company. Completely untried, untested. There was nobody that ever proven out. He called 150 companies all over the United States. They all turned him down. Finally, he reached a guy named Sherman Fairchild, who, whose family had been the original investors in IBM. And they had made a ton of money on IBM stock over the last 40 years. Sherman Fairchild had a camera company. Fairchild Camera Instrument. He said, okay, I'll take a flyer on this. So he invested a million dollars. These guys walked out, and that's how Fairchild Semiconductor was formed. This was their employment contract. <laughs> <laughs> These are the kind of guys they were. They all got together at a very famous hotel over on El Camino at that time. It was called Ricky's. They sat down around the pool. Jay Lass had gone to the bank and got an eight silver certificate, one dollar bills. And they all handed the eight one dollar bills out around the table and they all signed the dollar bills. And they all kept them. And that was their employment contract with each other. There's a nice signature on the dollar bill, which I actually love. It's way over here in the right hand corner. It's not the treasurer, it's not the secretary of the treasury, it's just above that. Art Rock. So Art Rock signed a dollar or two, and that was his way of saying, look, I'm not just putting money into the company, I'm in it with you. And that started another great tradition of venture investment in Silicon Valley. Someone who puts money into your company is there with you from the beginning through thick and thin. And that's the way Arthur Rock did business with these guys. Now, it took them a while to do what they did, but it didn't take them that long. Within about nine months, they had come up with a theory for how to isolate multiple transistors on a single piece of substrate using silicon, not germanium, which was what Shockley believed in, but using silicon. It was Gordon Moore and his chemistry that understood that this was possible, and it was Bob Noyce and his brilliance who came up with the engineering plan for the first integrated circuit, and it was a Swiss operations guy, a brilliant manufacturing guy named John Hernie, who figured out how to actually make it work. Do you guys use lab notebooks still? Do you use, do you use keep track of things? You know, it's got all your best thinking, plus your grocery list and your laundry list, and you know, you got to do it before you get home. This is Bob Noyce's lab notebook. This is his first lab notebook from Fairchild Semiconductor. And there's a very famous page, page 70, Dated January 23rd, 1959. And the entry is titled Methods of Isolating Multiple Devices. 
In many applications now, it would be desirable to make multiple devices on a single piece of silicon. It starts, and he writes it out longhand in his own handwriting, and he even starts to diagram how you would put multiple transistors on a single piece of silicon, connect them all up. This is the Dead Sea Scroll of silicon battery, because this is the lab notebook that first laid out the practical way to build an integrated circuit with multiple transistors and make it work. This is dated January 23, 1959, and by September, they had a working model. It's called a planar integrated circuit. It was completely sealed in a way that no one else had figured out how to do, so it was impervious to anything coming in and corrupting the connections or the transistors, and it worked. They went into production immediately, and of course, the same thing, something happened in 1959 that made all this like pouring gasoline on a fire, which was Sputnik. Everyone was scared to death of the Soviets getting into space first, and the best technology available to beat the Soviets in the space race was integrated circuitry and much more higher power, smaller, cheaper to produce computing to make all that happen. So, two things coincide. They walk out on Shockley, their brilliance gets proven out, Sputnik get, gets launched, and their fortunes really turn upward. Now, Gordon Moore continued to think about this. Gordon continued to think about, well, you know, uh, it's possible to put more and more and more components on a piece of silicon. They were doing it pretty rapidly. By 1964, Gordon had figured out that this really was the future. It was the future in two ways. You could put more and more transistors on a piece of substrate, and as you did that, the cost was going to fall dramatically. So Gordon not only figured out the science, he figured out the business model. And in 1964, there was a book published uh, in which uh, an author asked Gordon to write an essay. Gordon wrote a 100-page essay. Very unusual. You wouldn't really do that kind of thing normally. Gordon wrote a 100-page essay on this theory. A year later, Electronics Magazine came along and said, Gordon, would you write an article for us kind of boiling all this down? So Gordon wrote his article. And by 1965, there were really only about five points on the curve. So you couldn't really be sure that this expansion of computing power was going to go on essentially logarithmically like that for who knew how many decades or probably could do it for about 20 years. But he published this article in April 1965 in Electronics Magazine, and his good friend Carver Mead dubbed it Moore's Law. And as I said, it was not just a scientific model, it was a business model. Now, Moore's Law is not a law. There's no empirical reason that the number of components on a single transistor ought to keep doubling every 18 months for decades. That's not a law. That was a challenge. Fairchild, as it turns out, spawned 600 companies in Silicon Valley. That's just the first level of the family tree. If you took all the companies that Fairchild spawned over its history and you dropped down to the next level of the family tree, you'd essentially be populating many of the technology companies in North America that we know today. So a lot of it comes from these geeks, these renegades, these geniuses. Now Gordon turned out to be pretty right from 1960 to where we are today, about 2015. The number of transistors is well larger than that number. And you can see it's just continued on. It's continued on and on and on and on and on about every 18 months. The processing speed of a single microprocessor doubles. The cost falls about the same and everybody is running furiously to try to stay on this curve. Now, Gordon understood sort of logarithmic increases. This is his chart of his salary. <laughs> Gordon did a lot of things in his lab notebook besides talk about chemistry. In 1964, you can see, this is when he was at APL on the East Coast. Here he is with Shockley. Kind of flatline on Shockley, you know, not really much happening with Shockley. Fairchild, boom. 
This is 1964. So Gordon kept that. I asked one of our curators how many silicon transistors there are in the world today working, operating silicon transistors on silicon. And he did the research and called around and looked it up. And uh, this is his estimate of the number. 10 to the 21st power working transistors in the world today. Anyone, what's, what's the word for 10 to the 21st power? <laughs> it's a zettabyte. And I asked him, you know, what does that equate to? Is there anything else in the world there, 10 to the 21st power of? And he did the research on that. As it turns out, it's essentially equivalent to all the grains of sand on all the beaches in all the world. That's about 10 to the 21st power. So that's the number of working transistors there are in the world. And Moore's Law is not done yet. So that's what makes it kind of interesting. I showed you that curve a minute ago where it continues up past... You know, well past the billion mark now. Popular estimates in the industry are that Moore's Law has about another 10 years to run. Physically, it's going to become impossible to keep cramming more and more transistors together on a plane because the electrons start to misbehave when they get so close, and science has overcome that, but you can't ultimately overcome the laws of physics. So, microprocessor Architecture is starting to go up, we're starting to get multiple cores, getting a lot of other things to make the processing look like it's just continuing on a plane. But the actual, the actual pure scientific ability of more and more transistors to get crammed onto a chip the way the guys at Fairchild designed it over 50 years ago still exists today. And the estimates are, if Moore's Law continues for another 10 years, just another 10 years, we'll see an increase in computing power just based on that architecture of a million times beyond where we are today. A million times faster than we are in 2015. And that means by about 2020, the computational power that exists in the world will exceed all the computational power in the aggregate that has ever existed in the world. By 2020, it's not that far away. All the computational power in the world that has ever existed is going to be exceeded by 2020 just by operation of Moore's Law. So these guys are pretty smart. They made a fortune. They deserved to make a fortune. They spawned all these companies. They built the single most important transformational idea in the most transformational period that humans have ever lived through. So the big question is, what hath the law wrought? Well, this is one thing. This is a pretty shocking statistic. 90% of all the data generated ever in human history has been created in the last two years. That's just data. That's not knowledge. That's not publishing. It's just data. The world is filling up with data. And the faster the processing speeds go, the more data there's going to be. We are now entering, which is why I asked the question earlier, the zettabyte age. 10 to the 21 bytes. Now what does a zettabyte look like to you and me? I really, I'm not that technical. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around it. So here's a little statistic. <laughs> You want that Zenbot player, don't you? <laughs> it's going to run and run. You can put it on shuffle. You'll never hear this song again. Ever. Ever. So I'm waiting for the Zenbot player to come out. There's a, there's a new business for you. Here's another statistic. There are about somewhere around eight Zenbots of data in the world today in the aggregate. By the time we get to the million-fold increase in Moore's Law, there are going to be 40 zettabytes. That'll be over 5,000 gigabytes of data for every person on the planet. You know, as IDC noted, a lot of this is going to need protection. Already needs protection today. So these are just the kinds of things that are going to start happening as Moore's Law accelerates and accelerates. 
There's one other thing that has been operating behind all these, the, the recent beach geniuses and, and renegades, and it's, it's just the flow of capital. I mean, two things are happening, and I guess that's probably the core of my message this morning. We're going to see more computational power coming into the world than ever before, and there's more money chasing more ideas coming out of that computational power and everything that's been unleashed than ever, ever in our history. This is just a little chart of what's happening in venture capital, mostly here in Silicon Valley, exclusively in the United States. You can see, uh, even in the down years, there's still something like 25 to $28 billion in venture capital out there looking for ideas. Now it's you know, 59 or 60 billion people talking about $100 billion in venture money being available in 2017, 2018 if the economy continues to stay good around the world. It's the same incendiary mix that birthed Fairchild in 1959. The promise of computational power and Arthur Rock willing to back you if you had a good idea. It's the same mix. That's one of the wonderful things about history. You see these patterns repeated over and over and over again. And it's built on the same sort of building block principles that have changed computing from the first day. So when I think of the geek geniuses and renegades of today, then I start to think of, well, who are, who are those people? Who are the people who are really tapping into the, uh, this, this mix of computational power and, and capital flows? So I just, picked a, I just picked a statistic out of the Wall Street Journal. Here are, actually I think it's closer to 22 to 23. Startups that are valued at least a billion dollars now. We can see, obviously, it's all over the world. I don't know if you guys know Cloudflare. Anybody here from Cloudflare? Anybody work with Cloudflare in the city? Cloudflare, run by my good friend Michelle Zaplin. So it's up there. Evernote, Eventbrite, things you may know about. Olacaps, it's kind of the Uber of India. Grab Taxi, same thing in Southeast Asia. A lot of Me Too businesses up here. You know, Eventbrite, there are several versions of Eventbrite around the world. Mocha G is just a version of, a version of Amazon in China. Shopify, same thing. Bebe in China is a baby care, sort of a Toys R Us baby care thing online. These are all, these are all good, but this is kind of my final, I think my final point about the current machines and renegades. Everybody's chasing a lot, of, a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people are chasing the idea that looks just like the great idea that was back there last year. So where are the big breakthroughs going to come from? We, in that 368 conferences and meetings that come through the museum, you get to hear a lot of people talking about a lot of insight. And the one area that I hear about more than any other is currency. Anybody happy with your bank? Really happy with your bank now? Love your bank? Wells Fargo, Bank of America, really like them? There's one. No, their hands went up. Uh, the industry most likely to be disrupted, the best candidate for disruption, if you combine deep dissatisfaction with things, something you have to do almost every day, and combine that with great innovation in a way that's going to completely disrupt that thing you need to do almost every day, that's a great market for disruption. And I'm not just talking about Bitcoin. Uh, you know, Bitcoin is what it is. Nobody's quite sure how digital currency is going to work. But the banking sector, the money sector, the one that affects all of us, that may be the, the most likely to be disrupted as we see this inexorable climb of Moore's Law headed up to 2020. So, that's my look at the uh, geeks, geniuses, and renegades, uh, people who changed the world in the past who are changing the world today. Uh, I have such respect for the things that, that you guys are doing uh, with this open source way of looking at networking. My chairman, Lynn Shustick, would love you. He would love this event. i got to tell Lynn to come now that, uh, that you guys are here uh, because he and his business partner, Harry Saul, formed a little company uh, over 30 years ago called Network General. Have you ever heard of that? <laughs> <laughs> Lynn built the first sniffer. And uh, he and Harry sold it uh, all over the place, made, uh, made a fair amount of money. And uh, Network General sold and sold and sold and sold. And today, Lynn's 401k statement comes from Intel. <laughs> so, 
Anyway, he's a network, he's a network packet guy. And uh, I'm going to tell him about Shark Fest if anything is in, and maybe next year he'll come in. Maybe he'll give a keynote, or maybe he'll at least sit on the front row and listen to someone smart like Vince Surf or someone else talk to you. Thanks so much this morning. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, have a great conference. Thanks for being here at the museum.